Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, The Surface Topography of Silicone Breast Implants Mediates the Foreign Body Response in Mice, Rabbits, and Humans. I am Marie Stone of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Thermo Fisher Scientific. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. This webinar is educational and thus offers free continuing education credits. Please click on the continuing education window at the bottom of your screen to obtain your credits. I'd like to now welcome our speaker, Dr. Joshua Doloff, Assistant Professor, Biomedical Engineering and Material Science Engineering at the Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland. Dr. Doloff, you may now begin your presentation. Uh, first, I just want to say a quick thank you to the Thermo organizers of this webinar for the invitation to speak. Really appreciate the thought. Um, my name is Joshua Doloff. I'm an assistant professor in biomedical and material science engineering at Johns Hopkins University. I'm going to be speaking today about the surface topography of silicone breast implants mediates the foreign body response in mice, rabbits, and humans. Just to start you off, um, and you may be familiar with the ability of immune cells to phagocytose, eat up, and clear small nanoparticulates. However, when objects, larger macroscale devices, such as stents, electrode arrays, uh, pacemakers, large volumetric material inserts for bone or cartilage repair, uh, glucose monitors, and so on, um, exceed the size of a single cell, they're physically too large to be extruded and cleared from the body. And so as a consequence, the body turns to do the next best thing that it can, which is essentially seal the device behind a dense layer of scar tissue. And we call this process fibrosis. So when I first joined the lab, in my postdoc back at MIT, uh, <clears throat> I asked um, Bob, my mentor, Bob, basically, is this some sort of, sort of plastic sheath you put over the device? And he chuckled at first and said no. And in the next image he showed me, uh, which wasn't in his initial talk, which is why I went up to him and asked about this after the fact. Um, he said, it, here is the actual capsule. And if you take a look at this, there's a much more phlegm or white blood cell laden infiltration appearance to it. So when you cough up phlegm when you're sick, it has sort of a yellowish to white appearance. A lot of this is dense extracellular matrix. We can see this with uh, histology staining. You see a, a thick capsule that forms. These uh, de devices sit, are about the size of a USB key. And they actually were in humans for over six months. This was published back as I was entering the lab. Uh, they receive a wireless signal. It sends an electrical impulse to melt off a gold nano cover on a nano well, and it releases reservoir after reservoir of an, a drug. And in this particular case, it was a small molecule for uh, treating osteoporosis. Um, eventually, over time, Bob also mentioned you don't see much immunologic activity here, but after six months, we now know even beyond three months, as the capsule develops. Um, extensively, the immune system sort of goes away because it no longer really sees the surface of the device and needs to respond. And, <clears throat> and so that we, I'll show that in some of the data that I'm going to present today too. All right. To better understand, um, where does fibrosis even come from? It is a defense based mechanism in the body that obviously is not just relevant to biomedical devices, which have only existed for the past maybe one to 200 years. You go back far enough and you have metal shrapnel, lead bullets, bronze, copper um, from, from various eras of human history. But even then, that's not long enough for evolutionary time scales. Uh, only when you really go back to our paleolithic forebears with stone, bone, and even tooth fragments, wood splinters, and even larger pieces of dirt, do you also realize that they too get fibrosed when they enter in the body when they're not supposed to be. Another confounding variable in the field of fibrosis also was the, the lack of understanding surrounding what animal models are translationally relevant to a human. Um, as an example, biopsy and mice on the left here is very compliant, not, not that fibrotic. Uh, and actually, they're really good. They're Th2 immune skewed, really great for 
uh, antibody titers for cancer vaccine trials. Also notice that some strains of rats were a little bit more compliant, didn't fibrose much. Um, and then early on in our, in my postdoc work, we had a meeting with a specialist from Biogenetic. And they told us everyone in the field recognizes that the C57 black six mouse is the quote unquote profibrotic model that everybody needs to think about, at least at the rodent level. <clears throat> and then over years from working with um, pigs, uh, you know, many pigs, Yorkshires, large white and so on, we realized that <clears throat> they have an intact fibrotic response. So do New Zealand white rabbits, uh, various monkey species. In this particular case, we uh, I'll show data later on southern mongoose monkeys. And then obviously relevance to humans too. <clears throat> and so just to show you this quickly, uh, so here's an example of these clear translucent hydrogel spheres that we put place in these animals. Uh, just off, off from the start, you can see in the black six mice, all of them are very apparent visually. They're individually all fibrose. That This white yellowish appearance again is immune cell um, aggregation and uh, extracellular matrix deposition, adhesion on the surface. In Bob C mice, by comparison, very few show fibrosis. Most of them are still clear and translucent. The same volume, though, is in the, is in the field of view. And in Lewis rats, you see even less fibrosis, maybe some fur debris from just dissection of the animal. Um, in the monkeys, not only do you see fibrosis, uh, you actually have extensive embedding of the materials into shredding tissue. To do, this is uh, what we also see in the black six mice in time. Uh, usually it happens with non-collagen encapsul encapsulated uh, fat pads, uh, as opposed to, you know, lobes of the liver, kidney, spleen, and so on. Even when a capsule touches and even gets pushed in and embedded, we even, we even plucked out capsules from lobes of the liver before. They're not prominently fibrose. And the reason for this is because the collagen capsule segregates the main organ, except for the fat. The fat, fat in your body does not have collagen wrapping around the outside of it the same way that primary organs do. And they are highly vessel laden. So they are trafficking highways for the immune system to come through and to move out into surrounding tissues when there's a stimulus. And so an example of this is that, um, you know, in this case, it could be a tumor cell that gets damaged or a biomaterial that's abraded, implanted in a site and maybe rubbing or abrading against surrounding tissue or cells. And so there's stress or inflammatory cytokines that are released and immune cells have the capacity for sensing these signals and moving up the low end of the gradient, all the way up to the high concentration range of this gradient. You know, we ran a, a approximately a 30 merplex luminex assay, looking at many different potential cytokines in uh, global circulation. So in, it, it would be easy for clinicians, obviously, to be able to have a test where they could just bleed animals or take blood from people and, um, and maybe tell from just that alone, is your device implant system failing? Well, of, of approximately 30 factors, only four increase, and we only saw significant increases in one day, day, day one, one day following implantation. And when you follow up with each of these molecules, they all went back to baseline within the next three to four days, indicating that they, rather than seeing this long-term buildup, which is what we usually see locally around the implant, uh, we associated this instead with a day zero surgery event, which then dissipates over time. Now, this material system is really nice. It's actually translucent to start. Uh, it's the same hydrogels are found in, you know, food, food products such as boba tea, the bubbles and tapioca, uh, the ta tapioca, tapioca bubbles, excuse me, in tea and boba tea. Um, you have fake raw or sushi in, in, uh, so like the little orange fish eggs, which aren't always real because they're expensive. They could just be little hydrogel, um, spheres with a food and coloring additives to them. So. And if you ever run a DNA or agro, a DNA agrus gel or a polychromide Western blotting gel, it's the same sort of same sort of material class. Um, but in general, because of its translucent nature, you can see when it's non fibrous at all, completely clean, partially more completely fully fibrous, uh, and even when that fibrotic plaque starts to grow out outward and starts to attach to other surrounding either materials and they clump together or to fat and, and nearby tissue. Uh, when I joined the lab, uh, it also wasn't appreciated very much in terms of, well, is this all extracellular matrix? Is this all proteinaceous material or there are living cells on the surface of these materials too? And so we started, the, the lab, uh, members of the lab started doing nuclear DAPI scanning and saying, oh yeah, there are in fact living cells right at the surface, um, which we grew to appreciate and to understand that they were actually immune cells. And so here you can see CD68 positive macrophages, CD19 positive B cells. 
Alpha smooth muscle actin is a surrogate marker for fibrosis. It's expressed by um, smooth muscle, uh, sorry, um, fibroblasts, uh, activated myofibroblasts that come in and deposit are heavily involved in depositing collagen matrix. We also see LY6G positive neutrophils. And, uh, and so canonically, the view of biometrial response was protein, such as complement or coagulation factors, clotting factors, and, and antibodies in green optimization of, of the material surface or binding of protein to the material surface would make it readily visible and apparent to the immune system that it was not part of self and uh, precipitate sort of this fibrotic cascade. Originally, it was thought that neutrophils precede um, macrophages, uh, monocytes, macrophages, um, are, they mature from uh, their progenitor cell macrophage, monocytes, excuse me, are immature form that circulate in, in blood. So when macrophages move out of those blood vessels into the surrounding tissue or in the surrounding tissue site where the implant resides, not only do they um, hit a, a more mature phenotype, they also eventually will fuse together to cover the whole surface of the device and they form what's called foreign body giant cells. In the cascade of monocyte to macrophage to foreign body giant cell fusion, you also have recruitment of fibroblasts in the background and then layering of extracellular matrix in that time. Um, in my postdoc, I sort of I realized that there are many different tool sets specifically in the background for C57 Black 6, the strain itself. We have individual point mutations that knock out, for instance, individual immune cells, T and B cells alone, both combinatorially and so on and so forth. And even though there were some effects when you remove B cells, which are, uh, I, I'm, you know, we attribute to them secreting cytokines that further potentiate macrophage activity that drive fibrosis, it doesn't get rid of fibrosis completely. So we instead focused on, for instance, macrophage dysfunction, macrophage depletion, uh, even inhibition or polarization with small molecules we found many uh, instances where we could eliminate fibrosis completely in that regard. And so this, con this uh, notion, by the way, that neutrophils have to precede mat monocytes and macrophages is, is in this model incorrect. So um, even bioinformatics studies have recently shown with implant response that they actually are there within the first, both are there within the first few hours and uh, their kinetics are very similar. And actually, so functionally, um, when you deplete neutrophils, you actually see that not only is fibrosis still there, therefore it's not required for fibrosis to occur. Fibrosis got more, became more aggressive. Materials clumped even faster, which doesn't happen usually two weeks post implantation in the wild type case. It usually only happens maybe uh, uh, four plus weeks out. Um, and we attribute this to neutrophils having a subtype of cell called a myeloid suppressor cell that when you eliminate it, it, it removes a negative feedback check on the immune system and the immune system uh, overreacts and it attacks even faster. But only when you, in particular, when you lose macrophages and in combination with neutrophils, do you lose fibrosis altogether. What was also interesting is I implicated B cells before just briefly, but when you deplete macrophages, B cells in these last two cases never show up, they're gone as well. So macrophages we understand secrete a, they secrete a chemokine which we identified as CXL13, they le it leads to the later recruitment, downstream recruitment of B cells, which then show up. They don't secrete antibody, actually. They, uh, we again, secrete cytokines locally right in the fibrotic plaque, as I showed you. And they basically bring the level of fibrosis around one week at 50%. By two weeks, it's up to about 90, 95% um, material coverage. If you deplete Mac uh, B cells, it's stuck at that sort of 50% level, even later two weeks. All right. One of the cool things over time, I, I learned this from my tumor immunology days and my PhD. I learned how to use a gentle max dissociator uh, instrument to dissociate tumors, dissociate whole organs. Also then later adapted this technique for biomaterials and being able to dissociate and remove cells off the cells off the surface and actually obtain a viable single cell suspension. This could be used originally in the, in the context of tumors, but also here in biomaterial cases uh, for looking at cellular response at the therapeutic site of interest. And so in this case, this was my very first uh, 4A in flow cytometry. This is old school, two laser based fax caliber. And uh, got to respect the old CRT monitor too, but, you, but we essentially were, would use fluorophore is strictly usually in the green or the red or near infrared range just to avoid compensation issues. And I usually kept it at two color systems. In addition with dissociation, you can see here, 
the dissociation technique that we use, that I used and developed, removes 99% of the cells, maybe 95% or so, 90% plus, I guess, conservatively, see a little bit uh, remaining on some capsules. But the capsules are intact. We actually get most of the cells immune, immunologic response off the surface. And then we can stain them with different antibodies. Back back then, given that we were only trying to stick with red and green, um, you know, I had to I had to all caught individual samples into multiple tubes with only two antibodies in each, very limited ability to do multicolor panels. And so in the top case, it was C11B and C68 for macrophage response. And you can see day one, day four, seven, 14, and 28 it increased over time. Macrophages were in fact the largest dynamic responder. Neutrophils increased also at day one and then plateaued and even decreased slightly as macrophage compositionally, macrophages compositionally took over. And then B cells showed up more prominently in a delayed fashion at day seven, which is why I thought they were acting in an adaptive capacity, but again, they don't produce antibody here. Um, and, uh, and they ended up directly in the plaque. So they're doing something directly functional. In terms of, um, and so we did all that work in mice, which is really nice. There's a lot of immunologic tool sets. And then we, ex we expanded this work to sonomologous monkeys, uh, testing translation of this fibrotic um, phenomena that we were seeing. And so in, in larger animals like monkeys and, hu and, and us and human, in humans as well, there is a sack of fat, literally a tube of fat, a highly vascularized fat called the omentum that wraps around the entire GI tract. And you can see that here more clearly the day 28 sample. So the lobes of the liver would be at the bottom of the image. Here is the very bottom of the abdomen, which is called the Douglas space. At day zero, we have one port for the laparoscope to take photos, another port to put flush in capsules or to later retrieve them at different time points. And you can see all of them are easily visible at day zero. And by day 28, they're still visible, but they're almost, it almost looks as though they're sinking into the tissue. And histologically, when we look, Again, using HD Mason Strychrome, um, we see mostly fat and blood vessels, the natural, natural tissue here at day zero. Uh, and also later at day 28 with just a mock implant where we inject saline or PBS. So no material is present. When there is a form by a material, it gets literally grabbed by, uh, immune cells and fibroblasts secrete collagen, this dense blue around individual capsules that are, that literally get embedded and almost sink into the tissue. Furthermore, when we do immunofluorescent staining, you can see CD68 here, macrophages in green. We also have alpha smooth muscle actin uh, showing fibroblasts and fibrosis markers of response in the monkeys as well. Um, one of the cool things is a comparison here between mock and implanted for the black six mice showing macrophages in red and neutrophils in blue. We all, I was also able to, we, we could pinch away part of the omentum, take a, a piece of fat and tie a lariat suture around it so that the animals wouldn't obviously bleed out. Um, but we you know, dissociated those tissues or, or, or even isolated individually free capsules and dissociated the cells off the surface and also showed a very similar kinetic scale of response with macrophages and neutrophils as well. Further, we did gene expression analysis to show many of uh, immune markers in these models, CD68 macrophages in both the subcutaneous space as well as in the intraperitoneal abdomen. Um, LY6G neutrophil marker does not exist in monkeys or humans, so we use CD66B, which is here. And lastly, we also identified in rodents as well as confirmed in monkeys the relevancy of colony sibling factor one receptor and uh, being able to inhibit it to block fibrosis in these models. So lo and behold, over the over years in my postdoc and, and since then, we have this pipeline of testing material design, automating, in some cases, chemistry or testing physiochemical properties, testing the ability for materials to actually form and, and cross-link, and then to also look at fabrication techniques to get uniform, reproducible architecture and shape, because we also know that those mechanical features do affect host response as well. Uh, you could place these materials subcutaneously and do whole body imaging for inflammation. Uh, we also can place these in with, with graphs, like such as islets for type 1 diabetes, in more of a functional scenario in diabetic mice. And then uh, I know I showed you the, the monkey model data, but we've also, we also have a manuscript in consideration uh, where we've actually, you know, monkeys can be prohibitive, where you actually take a human, uh, human immune system and put it into a mouse in a humanized model. And we finally uh, obtained one after multiple attempts that actually shows fibrosis. All right, so moving forward, I just wanna talk about, um, shift tack a little bit and talk about breast implant, implants as the title implied 
And so just before I start, I just want to say that uh, when we were at the lab at MIT, uh, Establishment Labs, um, Motiva came to Bob and started asking about some uh, material sponsors they were seeing. And so Bob brought some of us in on the project, initially as consultants, just to give our feedback as we were sort of the local biocompatibility experts at the time. And and so over time, it became apparent, especially as discussions um, developed, that we actually wanted to do some investigation, investigational work and not just to straight consulting. And so eventually we we stopped being consultants and we started pursuing more of an academic project, which we recently published in Nature Biomedical Engineering this year. And specifically it rates to breast implants and the problems associated with them. And so I've already shown you guys uh, concepts of fibrosis and formation of a big scar tissue wall around the outside. Well, in the breast implant world, they call that a capsule. So you get this thick capsule that forms over implants and they can even Individual strands of fibrous tissue are weak, but many together um, gain incredible tensile strength. And you actually have a process called contracture that occurs, which is literally squeezing of the device. And, and, and in the case of a metal implant, like the microchips device, it won't distort. But for soft polymer implants, silicone implants, like breast implants, they will get become misshapen. You can even see ripple or tension lines through the skin. And so there are different surface um, architectures that have been studied over the years. Traditional control smooth is about a 20% failure rate within about 10 years of implantation. Um, Siltex Mentor uh, is it within eight years, maybe about 11% or so. Biocell had it also around a 20% failure rate after 10 years. And then interestingly, Motiva or Subsequent Labs had these two surfaces, smooth silk and velvet surface, that had like a 0.01% or something. Statistically, it was no, no different than zero really within the first five, six years. And I think they have data outwards of 10 plus years now. And so trying to break this down and understand well, what was happening here, because in order to really appreciate the technology, you want to know how it works, right? So um, in order to standardize breast implantation in comparisons across different, different technologies, the FDA released a standard an ISO document in 2018 um, clarifying that they describe quote unquote smooth implants as anything with a surface roughness below 10 microns. And so when you look at the roughness of these commercially available implants, the traditional smooth, which I'll show you scanning electron microscopy of the surface on shortly is basically very close to zero. Smooth silk surface is around three to four micron average roughness, velvet surface around 15, siltex uh, around 30 or 32, microcell and biocell uh, so micro textured here is anything above 10, but below 50 and macro textured is anything above 50 where these two fall into that category. So in addition to surface roughness, the mechanical properties such as loading and stress and strain, deformation, uh, hydrophobicity, something that affects beating up of water. So what ability surface chemistry, like if you do, you change the chemistry of the material or not. But really what we're going to be focused on today is we're going to show you that the chemistry is the same across these materials on the outside shell of the implant. And we're going to instead focus just on surface roughness alone, because obviously there was a very good understanding where we measured these, these values. Um, but there, we started to try to figure out this tighter surface topography. How does it affect host response and biocompatibility? So historically in the United States, the vast majority of implants have been smooth surface. Uh, the the high, higher texturing became very prominent in other countries outside in South America, Brazil, uh, Europe, Asia. And uh, it relates to, well, textured implants stick in place. They actually literally help hold in place a little bit better, but they also theorize that it improved biocompatibility and reduced scarring. Well, we saw some of the earlier fair rates and that in some cases maybe is sort of true, but in other cases, not so much. So we first wanted to just understand, well, how do these actually differ at the physical and chemical levels? So human-sized implants, we actually got commercial implants, took the shells from these implants and imaged them in scanning electron microscopy. So here's traditional smooth. Here's smooth silk. Again, average roughness of four microns, very small contact points, but still considered in that smooth category. Velvet, siltex, velvet, um, and siltex, again, I think in this case, yeah, they both fall into microtexture, then by a cell falls into macro texture. And so how are these how are these produced? Well, we worked with uh, material science team at establishment labs to then miniaturize variants of these implant types. And so we got, a, uh, so the first three were produced with a mold. Literally you create a mold, you flow silicone over it, you flip it inside out and basically there's your surface. So here's smooth, here's smooth silk-like and velvet-like, similar average roughnesses. 
Siltex is actually produced by a different manufacturing method as, as is Biosil. Uh, Siltex is produced by taking a polyurethane foam and literally dabbing it into wet silicone and getting sort of a, a, tex a, a textured surface from that. So the biocell is produced by salt loss. So you see these big cubic like structures because they literally will take wet silicone, dunk it into salt, flow, uh, dunk, uh, dunk another, dunk it one more time into silicone, get another thin layer on top. They then submerge the implant, the salt dissolves and, and diffuses through the upper layer. And then they take a brush and scratch open these sort of big open cavities that look kind of cubic and salt like in shape. Um, and uh, so we also, uh, uh, utilize a technique called non-contact profilometry, which doesn't just look at visual topography. It also looks at quantifying the level of how high do the peaks rise above the average plateau and then how low do the valleys fall. And, and in addition, it also can give you a really good sense of how dense or how sparsely uh, far apart are the individual contact points that potentially immune cells might grab onto. And so we see reasonably good comparison between the human size implants and then the miniaturized implants, which we'll show you later in the mice. In terms of uh, the numbers that we received from quantifying individual units and the, uh, shells from different units, again, we, it was close to zero for the, the traditional smooth four microns, 15, 28, 15, 83 for the human scale implants. And then for the mini implants, we didn't, we didn't get truly one that fully recapitulated the average close to the microcell implant but most of the others are reasonably well um, um, represented. Zero, four, and 15 are identical here uh, for the first three. Uh, polyurethane foam is close. It's around 30. And salt loss technique at 90 is close to the 83 for the human scale. Uh, and then we also elicited, um, so, so showing that surface topography is similar, we, we also elicited a, a used, utilized technique called XPS or X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy showing that the chemistry in the shell, the chemicals and the elements in the shell of the implant are similar to, we looked at carbon, oxygen, silicone, which obviously makes sense. And then platinum is used as the catalyst and cross-linking of silicone and it's toxic to living systems. So you can see not determined, thankfully in all cases across the commercial, as well as the miniaturized mouse implant and pretty good consistency at, at each of these elemental levels, no significant differences popped out. <clears throat> all right, so we started in the the human scale case, we actually had a, a visiting surgeon show us this insertion technique, shaved and sterilized the, the surgery field, put a sterile drape, we scrubbed in, used sterile gloves, we dropped a sterile implant out of a sterile package directly from, you know, vendor materials, and we used what is called an insertion sleeve. It actually almost looks like a little funnel that you would put icing on a cake. And what it, what it allows you to do is apply back pressure, you twist and, and push the implant out through a very small opening, a very small opening at the end of the cone, uh, which allows you to get distort the implant very temporarily, but it, get, it allows you to get a very big implant into a very small incision line. This is uh, incredible. And I, when I saw it for the first time, it amazed me. And so we, we obviously have, we uh, place the implant over to the side, away from the incision line. Again, so they're not overlapping. We don't have to worry about confounding. Like when we look at response, well, is it to, due to the injury of the incision or is it due to just the implant material presence? And then the rabbits recovered quite nicely and we monitored them for however long we wanted to. Just to show you uh, what contracture looks like, the control smooth implants, even as early as three weeks, showed contracture. So you can see the ripple lines here and pinching the skin. It, they, they shift around a bit. It, it, it's almost like it's like they're kinked or crinkled, almost like crinkled plastic. Uh, in the case of smooth silk, very supple response, the four micron surface um, did not have the same appearance after the same time point. Um, and so this contracture lines and ripple lines happen in human patients too and obviously cause problems, not only with um, uh, implant response, but also irritation and discomfort to the patient. So this is a lot of work summarized in just one slide, but basically we see at three and at three weeks and at six months, the fibrotic thickening here. Uh, so you see this red dotted line. So to the right is the fibrotic layer. You can see it in dense blue, newly formed collagen in Mason's trichrome, as opposed to this smooth slope form micron surface, very thin, very controlled. And you can see the quantitation of this uh, um, at, from at three weeks on top of the implant, as well as the bottom of the implant. You can see control smooth down to silk surface, a little bit up with velvet. And then for the three, uh, so one of the microtextured siltex and then the two macrotextured actually form what we see, what, what clinicians see clinically in human 
patients. Uh, so doctors see this quite often where they call it double capsule formation. So instead of a single ring of fibrotic layer, there's an outer capsule. So there's a red line and then another orange line here, pale orange line. And then there's a darker kind of pink or purple zone where there's a harder inner capsule that forms and it almost fills in the actual topography of the surface of the implant. In the case of the most macro textured bias, so you can almost see lines that move back and forth as you're seeing the texture basically being mirrored in that inner capsule. But at three weeks on top, on the top side of the implants, as well as the bottom, we took two different locations for each. You can see a much thicker capsule for these larger tex textured or topography surface implants. Uh, hours of six months, the phenomenon is very similar. Again, as I mentioned before, um, there's a little bit of thinning out of the capsule in general because the immune system starts to go away a little bit. At three weeks, you see here 1,500 thickness, micron thickness. And at six months here on the top side implant, they're down to about 1,000. It's still the largest amongst the group. Uh, on the bottom side of the implant, it's about 1,000 here. And I would say between 500 and 1,000 after six months as well. So a little bit of thinning. But across these implants, you see uh, double capsule, especially in the two larger sizes, uh, also with microcell, which is not shown here. Seroma, when you actually open these implants up, there's a lot of liquid, a lot of inflammation, a lot of, a lot of um, immune response. Fibrosis scoring, uh, we quant just from the quantitation, this is obviously a qualitative presentation of this. And then contracture, we saw ripple lines as early as three weeks for the control smooth, and then more so with the higher texture, the higher topography implants too. All right, so in the mice, uh, Again, we tried placing them in the mammary fat at the base of the belly at first, and then we, we realized was that the skin is very taut there, and it made it difficult in terms of wound healing in some cases. So we ended up rotating the implant on the back of the hip. This was a very early surgery attempt, actually, with four wound clips. The, the smaller incision, even in a mouse, the less chance for bacterial contamination and complications. But we, I also later put the incision higher up in a lateral position, and then we slid the implant down right in front of the hip to make sure, again, they were not overlapping in all cases. And uh, and why was that okay? Well, in the mice, interestingly, with all their mammary fat pads that start on the belly side, they actually wrap around the back of the animal, the back of the neck, as well as in the front of the hip. And so when we placed the, the breast implant here, it was, believe it or not, still sitting in mammary fat. And again, so reiterating what I said before, implants were made with the same manufacturing techniques. So mold in the case of the control, smooth surface, um, smooth silk, excuse me, velvet surface, polyurethane foam imprint here for PU, for polyurethane. And, uh, and then the salt loss here, you can see much larger um, <clears throat> nooks and crannies on the surface of these implants. And these are all actually coming out of the animal after about three weeks or so. And you can even see the, the, that really large texture, you get a lot of aggregation of other biologic molecules, maybe blood and, and tissue and some clotting factors. Um, all right, so we monitored implants, <clears throat> many implants in mice over a long time course. We did a full, the full range of textures for at least three and six weeks, in some cases 12. We did a control though of the traditional smooth versus uh, smooth silk outwards of at least six months. And so when, we, when you resect the tissue and you flip it over, you see very thick capsules for the traditional zero micron smooth, uh, very thick, excuse me real quick, very thick capsules that form it's nice and mice, the tissue and the implants being smaller, you can actually get most of this in one histology cassette in one image. And so there's the top side of the skin with the fur follicles. Here's the lower line musculature. And then here's the capsule on the top side as it comes down into the area that meets up with the lower lying tissue, fibrotic capsule also on the bottom. And this happens in human patients. You actually see these ripple lines in, in this interspace where they, where they both meet. For the four micron surface, just be, both technically being qualified as smooth implants, just having slight topography actually does something to make the response very uniform and controlled, very thin, almost translucent like capsules in all cases. And histologically, you see also similarly corresponding very thin, uh, very, very thin uh, collagen deposition. Actually, when I quantify the thickness of this on average, it was about one tenth of the thickness of the fibrotic layer for the control smooth implants. So for the full range of implants, you can see very thick here for the zero micron control smooth, very thin, the thinnest in fact for all of them for the four micron smooth smooth silk, um, 15 micron velvet surface is a little bit larger, 30 micron close to Celtex, I guess, and, and rough, average roughness is uh, a little bit thicker still. And then the biocell like 90 micron salt loss technique, very thick capsules here, but um, starting to become on a more similar scale as the control smooth 
some very there's some variability here at three weeks at, at, at six weeks where this data matches you can see <clears throat> that control smooth is not great four micron surface ameliorated capsule thickness formation to the greatest extent and then obviously it's tighter on the way back up as uh, you start achieving higher macro texture uh, texture status all right so one of the things that we did do initially uh, trying to qual uh, understand the immune response is that we ran multiplex and string analysis and there were two categories that popped up one where smooth silk had gene expression that was depressed and, and inhibited or lower and some of the things popped out very clearly collagen 1a1 lower expression makes sense less those less fibrosis CD68, lower macrophage response. They're associated with fibrosis, uh, less pre lower presence in the capsules. TNF-alpha, less inflammation, and so on and so forth. We saw the same thing in black six mice. Here, F480 and CD68 macrophage markers also decreased. Um, and then there was another subtype of, of genes that increased with smooth silk. And the genes that increased were actually associated with an immunoinhibitory phenotype, FOXP3, regulatory T suppressor cell marker is here. We also had immunoinhibitory cytokines, IL-4, IL-10, IL-13 as an example. And the same thing in not only rabbits, but the same thing was also observed. Uh, FOXP3 is here, IL-4 is here. Same thing was observed in the mice, IL-10 is here, and so on. All right, now one of the problems with this doing this type of analysis is that this is all RNA coming from mixed tissue. So even though you might say this is a specific immune marker like FOXP3, it should be for Tregs. Someone, someone's going to say, well, you didn't sort cells and you didn't do single cell analysis. So how, how immunologically relevant is this? You don't really know for sure where things are coming from. So went back to our old techniques in the wheelhouse of dissociating tissues and one, one to get single cells for flow cytometry analysis. And now with modern technologies, including Thermo as a tune NXT system, including their, their Psychic Max uh, 96 will play auto sampler, we're able to not like I earlier on all the samples into multiple tubes for only a few antibodies in each. We now can go upwards of 14 different colors. It's a very high combinatorial possibility. Our particular build of our instrument is violet, blue, yellow, and, and red, as opposed to a green laser in the position of the yellow. Um, we just felt that it had the highest combinatorial possibility to use the most popular fluorophores. And so we ended up getting CD68, C11B, innate myeloid cell identity, showing that they again correlate heavily with the level of fibrotic response that we were seeing. And in addition, there was this phenomenon or a theory in the field that uh, FOXP3 Tregs were important for suppressing immune response. Um, for micron surface was increased, but so were the, the other uh, topographies, the larger topographies. And so we wanted to understand this more. So on the left, this is absolute number of cells, but on the right, this is percent composition. And I'm trying to differentiate between the two because just because something is lower percent, if it's also like 10, uh, tenfold less cells, it's going to also be on an absolute scale, a much more muted response. And uh, before I show you, we ended up going to single cell RNA-seq analysis also with the dissociated tissues to really look at the phenotype. Someone might also say, well, compositionally, they're the same percentages, but are these FOXP3 Tregs really, truly inhibitory Probably, maybe, but it, it also depends on the balance with other cell types like CD8 T cells and other more pro-inflammatory phenotypes to determine the overall net effect in the tissue. But real, real quick, first with a multicolored panel, we were using CD3, CD4, uh, gated into CD25 and FOXP3. So here's unstained, just background levels. Here's the control smooth surface. So you can see a prominent CD4 population and a very low co-positive CD25 and FOXP3 population showing very low Treg presence, confirming this. This is where we got these numbers from. And then this, the four micron surface had a, a, a much larger Treg presence as, as shown here, uh, approximately about five or six fold higher. All right, but schematically, again, we take the out, outer line capsule right around the peripheral implant, dissociate it. We can separate it, not just for, for flow, which I'm gonna show you more data on right now, but also for RNA-seq. So firstly, at two and four weeks, we did this and we ran much larger uh, antibody panels all in the same tube, same sample, just with different fluorophores using the attuned system. CD3 positivity, CD3, CD4, CD25, FOXP3. And so again, you see the confirmation of the higher Treg presence. CD19, B cells seem to be higher compositionally, percentage of CD45 in the 90 micron implant group, as were, as were CD3, CD8 co-positive effector cytotoxic T cells. Uh, same ob observations at four weeks. When we, when we um, graphed the level of Tregs over CD8 T cells, 
we actually saw a, a higher shift towards suppressive Tregs in the four micron group at both time points, uh, and less so with with zero and, and the ninety micron groups. Fibroblast wise, we we didn't see too much significant difference. The percentage values were very low. We only tended we only saw a little bit of an increase in ninety micron group at, at a tubic time point using not just alpha sumosal actin but also co-positivity for fibroblast activation protein. All right. So in addition to just cell numbers, though, as I mentioned, phenotype is important. And so using principal component analysis of, of single cell RNA sequencing data, we, we determined we were able to determine where neutrophils fell in this plot, macrophages, monocytes, dendritic cells, T and K and B and B cells. And so comparing a couple of select genes as an example, so a transcription factor involved in immune response, CXCL10, which is important for cell stress and interfering again on pro-inflammation cytokine, you can see zero micron versus four micron versus 90 micron. And now you start to see with this really macro texture group, how much higher expression you're getting in some cases, especially here for uh, interferon gamma, falling in the, in the TNNK group. If you don't just look at three genes, you know, look at everything we ran, uh, zero, is not, zero micron is set to the baseline control at zero, uh, four micron. There's a, there are definitely some genes going up and some genes going down. We even stride it into all of these different immune cell types again. This data is in the supplement of the paper. But with the 90 micron group, especially, you have, you have a much higher level of many genes. There's a number of clusters of genes here that are, that are exacerbated further. And this is all, this can also be visualized by literally um, looking at the fold change differences between 90 and four. And 90 has significantly higher expression as well as lower expression of a great number of genes. If you compare the four micron surface to zero control, there aren't, there aren't a significant uh, outlier group either up or down. In that, in that case, all right. So, um, so I'm starting. We're starting to put these the picture together in terms of single cell data now, <clears throat> and then we want to look longer term. So, four micron smooth silk surface <clears throat> has the best inhibition by what we think is Treg induction compared to traditional smooth. So, here's the capsule thickness, and again, as I mentioned earlier, by about three months or twelve weeks, you can see the capsule starts to shrink a little bit as some of the immune system goes away, some of the inflammation volume goes away. But in the case of the four micron smooth silk surface, it's actually a, a very active rather than passive inhibition, and it's maintained over a long period of time. Uh, you can see CD68, C11, B mirrors what we're seeing in the fibro in terms of the capsule thickness in both cases. Significant levels of reduction at smooth silk with smooth silk all, at all time points. And what's interesting is that FOXP3, the Treg marker that we highlighted earlier, that I've highlighted earlier was significantly increased with the four micron surface at all time points, outwards of even six months. Again, Tregs are important for preventing autoimmunity, overreaching immune response, attacking your own tissues. We know about them maybe in the context of cancer, hijacking Tregs to shut down kill, killer T cell response too. Um, but in the context of what they do, they can secrete cytokines indirectly that are inhibitory. They can also affect macrophage subtype differentiation in their, in their behavior. They can even bind with checkpoint inhibitor pathway molecules such as CTLA-4. And so we hypothesized, well, Tregs are truly important for the four micron surface. When we went into a T cell deficient variant of the Black 6 model, so the nude, mice, nude variant, you can see that the capsule thickness for the control smooth zero micron surface didn't change much from wild type response, but the capsule for the four micron implants dramatically thickened, definitely, definitely implicating T cells in their active suppression of a thick capsule. Capsule thickness now look no, no difference uh, in term you know, compared to the four, four versus zero and macrophage response also increased dramatically, statistically being no different as well. Lastly, I just want to show some human data. We're very proud of this. Uh, so what happens in humans? You know, again, we want to talk about generalizability of findings from rodents into rabbits into, into obviously clinically relevant patients and patient samples. So we're able to get FFPE, hormone fixed preference embedded samples, and, and perform histologic analysis to look at the capsule thickness for controlled smooth implants, uh, smooth silk, a very thin pink layer here with blue. You can see there's almost like a line of demarcation here. Biocell also had sort of a, a line of separation of pink outer ring, even blue outer ring. And so quanti quantifying these uh, using MSJ, you can see a statistical inhibition or, or, or reduction in capsule thickness with the four micron smooth silk surface.
And uh, so establishment labs also contributed these images, but you can see that in, at six months, not much of a capsule, very thin, even by 26 months in a patient, very thin layer that they don't yet want to remove. And then after five years, they literally pulled out the capsule. You can see how thin and translucent it is. And actually, if you let it sit, what we, what we observe is if you let it sit in the air for too long, it'll start to uh, dry up a little bit. And that's why it tends to have this like, kind of cracked like appearance to it. But it's very controlled and maintained for long periods of time, is from, from what we can tell in many patients. And, and so we ended up also performing an industry analysis, comparing four micron smooth silk, seeing a nice clustering of phenotype here amongst many genes. Here's traditional smooth in the middle showing a, a more varied response, but, but not too different, but still varied. You can see one sample here, uh, looks pretty distinct. And then there's some other blue popping out in these groups, uh, in these individual samples coming from, these are from five different individual human patients, by the way. And in the case of the 90 micron group, there was a very uh, distinct subset phenotype that, that popped out in these samples as well, tying yet again, surface topography and average roughness and other features of surface topography to host biocompatibility and implant response. There's more data in the paper. Uh, the biocell implant has now been rescinded off the market. It was a voluntary recall by the company after the FDA recommended it. Uh, when, some, when they brush open those cavities on the surface, um, there's the possibility for microparticle wear debris to shed off into the surrounding tissue. We actually saw it in the rabbits too in the histology samples, little, little pieces of polymer sitting in the tissue. Uh, larger surface area, though, people are looking, also looking at bacterial contamination, biofilm formation, and lastly, just the ability, they call it tribology, but the ability for a much more textured implant to rub against tissue and to literally scratch and to damage the surrounding tissue to a greater extent. So I just want to say thanks to the team at MIT, obviously our mentor, Bob Langer, uh, Jenny and Morgan in the animal facility there who helped with many of the rapid procedures, especially our team at Johns Hopkins, a new PhD students in the lab that, that uh, I started as of 2018. Amid, who was a, a fellow postdoc back at MIT, is now Professor Rice, Mark Clemens, and others at uh, MD Anderson and Baylor uh, as part of that consortium in Texas, and then the establishment labs and Motiva team. So uh, Dr. Sforza was a, um, a specialist who came in to show us that uh, imagine insertion sleeve technique uh, trans, uh, implantation procedure was super cool. Uh, uh, Roberto, um, leading scientific initiatives at the company. I think he's a CSO officially, I believe. Um, amazing uh, feedback. The company has been very research for this whole time because they generally care not only about how their implants are working, but also how to make them better. They want to, they want to help patients and they want to, and they don't want patient, uh, individuals to worry about these other side effects that have happened in the past. Uh, the team at Establishment Labs, the material science and research team also for development of the miniature implants are too many people to name individually. And the CEO of one was also uh, amazing lead patient forward comes from a family of, of surgeons who care very deeply about patient health as well. And obviously all of the players in this consortium. So without further ado, happy to take any questions you have. Uh, and thanks for, thanks for listening. Thank you, Dr. Daloff, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. Let's get started. And our first question is, many have wondered, is it just the surface directly or secondary effects of bacteria, biofilm colonization, tribiology, tissue movement and friction, and or surface particle wear debris. Can you discuss these potentially contributing factors? And what is the popular thought in the field right now as to which may have a larger contribution to host rejection response? Thanks for the excellent question. Um, and, and Marie and Michelle and the others for the invitation again. Um, it's a complicated area of the field right now. I think there's a lot of evidence to show that the more pockmarked the surface is, there is the potential for higher, literally higher surface area and sort of these nooks and crannies where bacteria can seed, settle, and create biofilm. We know that in the field of fibrosis, when biofilms or bacteria are present, they do exacerbate inflammation, and that does feed forward into fibrotic response. Um, but from what we've seen here, so the data from this paper and from the presentation that you saw today, 
It was heavily focused on techniques that were complete, were done in, in as, as sterile a manner as possible. As possible, we actually eliminated one rabbit, for, for instance, that um, was scratching at its incision suture line. It did become infected with bacteria, and we ended up excluding the animal completely and had to replace it with another another procedure. Uh, so we really, in this particular case, what's interesting is that you know we had the ability to synchronize everything, same surgical technique, same sterile, everything pre-sterilized. Um, we, there were no, there's no variation from clinic to clinic or from surgical technique or surgeon technique to surgeon. Um, and so what we were trying to do at least is regardless of the stimuli that makes host rejection worse, which yes, it can be in theory if bacteria is present. We, we tried to at least uh, ensure that that did not happen here. Where particle debris, there's a lot of uh, evidence to show that, you know, due to that earlier process of frustrated phagocytosis, immune cells can't eat up particles so they then swarm around the surface and it maintains a long-term chronic inflammation response rather than a short-term acute one. Uh, and then even, and so that obviously can play a role. Um, and then we also, we also interestingly had a lot of conversations with plastic surgeons and even with patients talking about lifestyle choices. Like if you were a heavier patient or you were more muscular or, and you were physically active versus not so physically active, did you like to skydive? Did you like to go deep sea diving? You know, so exertion of pressure on the implant or on your body, the ability for more abrasion and movement uh, where the implant surface could rub against nearby tissue. So that's what we call tribology. So the friction, the frictional components of it and the abrasion and stressing of those cells and so on. So it's, we, there's the possibility that all of them are involved to some degree. I think right, as of right now for this particular data set, what I think is clear is that we see direct, sur direct effects of the surface outright clearly. Uh, from just a, from just a tightered surface topography, um, I think as, as a next step, we're very interested in you know spiking in bacteria in a controlled manner across the board. Maybe also um, you know there's a lot of I think there are groups. For instance, there's the Center for Biofilm Engineering in Montana State. There's other there's other groups around the country that are actively doing some of these other types of studies in vitro. You know I think the tricky thing sometimes though is that when you're working in a cell culture dish, how do you properly Recapitulate all the movement, right? How, do you use a cheesecloth? Do you use a different type of biomaterial on the surface that's 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 literally laterally moving back and forth to try to scrape scrape away or brush away some of the implant shell topography? Um, there, the techniques being used are much better than what they than with where they were originally in the field. But uh, if you were gonna, if you wanted to ask my firm opinion based on the data that we saw, we see we definitely had real real time evidence of particulate debris in the surrounding shells for at least the, the large range, um, the highest micro and macro textured implants, not for the, not for the rest. And so that, there was clear evidence, even just from the, the rabbit model, that that was potentially playing a role in the host rejection response we were seeing. Now, you know, there's this crazy um, excision plan that, that was released by the company where that was originally selling by a cell. It was like a 14 point plan that said, if you follow every one of these steps, you can remove the entire fibrotic tissue capsule around the biocell implant group and then reduce or eliminate the risk of, of hopefully what they later saw to be, there was actually a lymphocytic, a breast implant associated lymphoma that was forming in some very minute uh, wedge of patients. But it was, uh, it was risky, which it was shown to be risky, which is why the FDA requested from the company to do a voluntary recall and they ultimately did. Um, and thankfully that particular topography was not used heavily in the US, although it has been used worldwide in other contexts. So yeah, it's, it's a complicated field. I think more investigation needs to be done, but uh, we're already seeing some evidence that it's at least one, if not multiple of those factors for sure. Thank you, Dr. Dalloff. Do you have any final comments for our audience? Um, you know, I think the crazy thing with all this work Really, also from seeing the perspective of you know plastic surgeons, sometimes that you know it's it's amazing they were really resistant to change surgical techniques in the field. You know, it's like they learned from their grandmaster mentor, like you know who, what Jedi master did they learn these things from, and eventually got to a place where if your failure rate as a clinical surgeon was worse, significantly worse than the average failure rate in the hospital you know, you wouldn't get your annual bonus or it would affect your reputation with patients, right? So they would obviously at that point be behooven, they, they'd be moved to, to consider another alternative solution. Um, and now that it's crazy, but now we're finally seeing these inter this interesting titered four micron surface or the four micron average roughness surface, smooth silk, that 
is has an active effect. And I think surgeons are now having to consider, well, okay, well, if there's a technology now that dramatically improves success or the rate of success, they, ha they have to consider it, at least for themselves, from that perspective. But, you know, really, realistically, just getting the data out there, and we had a lot of conversations about this too, because the, the, the story went to a nature journal, which plastic surgeons don't typically read. They usually look at the, the journal of plastic surgery, let's say. And so we were wondering, do we do another follow-up sort of release in more plastic surgery journals? But the reality was, to us at least, is if what we discovered from speaking with patients and doctors is that most breast implant patients are quite differential to their surgeons and the clinicians that they work with. Uh, we just wanted to get this information out there so that the patients themselves, hopefully in concert with their doctor, can make the most informed choice about the risks, the risk, the potential risks and their own personal health involved as well. Um, and, and maybe they'll feel like this seems like the at least in terms of the topography the range of rough the roughness ranges or texturing in general for the met for the larger ranges of texture um you know it's a simple enough concept for anyone to come into a clinic's office like a clinician's office and to be able to discuss this at a basic level and it, it's approachable right it gives them a basis for having a discussion and saying well does this make sense or doesn't it and you know, it's amazing too. Doctors in the past, lastly, I'll, the last point I'll make is um, doctors in the past, just for needs of, of symmetry, you know, in most cases, obviously, there's definitely augmentation cases, but we are looking actually as a next step also, hopefully, at patients, uh, cancer patients who've had double mastectomies and reconstruction. And, um, you know, in some cases, a doctor would either put a different volume implant on the left versus the right side if there's some asymmetry, or if maybe the, even the, the, the bone plate, the, like the sternum and the chest plate, is not perfectly symmetrical in terms of how it's angled. Um, but some cases they would also place in two different implants, one with one surface topography on the left and one with a different surface topography on the right. And uh, and does it does and and interestingly because of that, <laughs> we found out from the company that they don't ever they sell units as individual units. They don't actually sell them as left and right pairs for that reason because it's a lot of clinicians don't want to buy them as paired implants because they want to have the flexibility. So it's weird thinking about these things from a market perspective and a personal health perspective, but we, we sometimes need to on the research side as well. Um, and I guess it just got us to a place where at least now there's information where more information where a patient feels maybe more empowered to make personal health decisions, you know, for the long term. Yeah, but I guess that's it. And uh, if there's any more questions, I'm happy to obviously field them later remotely uh, if, the, if the thermo team sends them to me. Otherwise, thanks for listening. Really appreciate it. Well, thank you again, Dr. Doloff, um, for your time today and your important research. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Thermo Fisher Scientific, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting question. Uh, questions, if you have questions that you needed to submit or think of at a later time, um, Please do so, and they will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye. <laughs>